Anybody knows where Chris is, where the speaker is? All right, there comes Chris. All right. Well, introduce yourself. Hi. Um, my name is Chris Rapier. I am here to lead a uh, discussion about TCP stack instrumentation. So I'd first like to start by saying this is a few more people than I expected. So I really appreciate your interest in this. And I hope that we can get started with a good discussion on what we want to see out of stack instrumentation and try and determine what our next steps are with this. Uh, if you could all do me a favor, um, part of the goals of this is to actually come up with a mailing list so we can continue this conversation later on. I'd also appreciate it if, so in that sense, I was hoping you could sign a sign-up sheet that I'm going to be passing around. Also, my bosses like to know how many people I've actually talked to, so that helps with that as well. So if you could take a moment to sign this email and let me know if you actually want to join the mailing list, I would appreciate that. So if you could pass that around. And if you don't want to sign or put your email down, that's fine with me too. So, so for privacy reasons, if you don't want to sign, you don't have to. No, you have right? no obligation to sign Thanks. whatsoever. Right, just put yeah. a, put your blow or whatever. He just wants numbers. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm going to set, be setting that up later. Uh, so don't worry about it if you don't want to put your email down. I understand entirely. Um, so what's the agenda? Please sign in if you can and if you're comfortable with doing that. Otherwise, not a problem. Uh, give a quick introduction as to who I am, what my view on stack instrumentation is, use cases, uh, implementation questions and considerations, and then next steps. Uh, and throughout all of this, I want you all to know I want your input. Uh, I only have a few minutes worth of stuff to talk about, so if no one else is talking, this is going to get real boring. So please share in the conversation. Uh, my name is Chris Rapier. I'm, a, a, I'm an academic. Please don't hold that against me. I work at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center in lovely Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're part of Carnegie Mellon University. I'm a research engineer slash scientist with them specifically focused in high performance network behavior diagnostics and things along those lines, specifically geared towards how we improve uh, the network for users. Uh, we support scientific users from a lot of different fields. We're mostly involved with moving large amounts of data, big data, um, from collection points and other nodes on our research and education network to compute nodes and, and data storage sites. Um, we are dealing with very large data sets. Uh, we're dealing with particle physics data sets, uh, astrophysics data sets, uh, genomics data sets, we're talking about data sets that are currently running 50 to 75 terabytes in size. And our projection is that within the next 12 to 18 months, we'll start seeing 200 plus terabyte size data sets that we're going to have to be moving. Um, and our view is that this is just going to be normal for us. And that the amount of data that we're going to be transferring is just going to keep increasing, especially in the genomics field. Um, there are devices out there now that can generate a terabyte of data a day um, of genomics data, and that data has to go from the collection point to data aggregation sites to compute nodes. And in that aspect, we're supporting the National Institute of Health, National Library of Medicine, uh, various genomics uh, groups all over the country. Um, I have done some previous work. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with HP and SSH. Um, that's a set of performance patches to SSH that I implemented around 10 years ago that never made it upstream. Uh, people are still using it, though. Um, lately, though, I've been involved in Web 10, 10 G, also known as Web 10 Gig. This is our attempt at implementing um, an RFC called RFC 4898 which is a description of around 127 different TCP stack metrics. Um, the goal of that was to actually break open the black box that is the stack and get more information 
about what's happening along the stack, the path, the application, and various other classes of metrics up to the user or into user land to be more specific. So we can provide actionable information based on that data. Um, so what it's always good to have a shared language with this, so I just want to start with what I view as instrumentation. Um, specifically, I'm talking about a method of collecting data regarding per flow characteristics not normally revealed by the stack. So these are specific instruments that are not currently implemented, which tells us something about what's happening in the stack, or at least in terms of how the network is performing in terms of throughput performance, uh, congestion, and <coughs> failure modes and things like that, and bring them up to the user. Um, it's important that we make sure that all the collected metrics are brought are revealed to user land. Uh, if they just stay within the stack, there are there is value to that, but it does not necessarily provide the maximum amount of value uh, to our goals. Um, now, the issue is also that the instruments have to provide some sort of real value. Um, they don't have to provide real value to every user, but they have to provide value to some set of users that has a valid use case for them. Uh, this leads to questions about how we're gonna validate the instruments, how do we make sure that the, we know the instruments are doing what we think they're doing. And related to that as well, especially when we're dealing with um, you know, production environments, especially high load production environments, how do we quantify the impact of each instrument on overall performance? Uh, if we can't determine what impact the instruments are having, we can never turn around and say like, yeah, have this on all the time or only use this when you really, really need it because it's gonna screw your performance up. Uh, quantification, I think, is a really important aspect of this. So this is where the audience, participa audience participation part starts and I really hope you'll help me out with this. So we need to talk about use cases. And in terms of use cases, we need to talk about what instruments or what kind of information would support those use cases. Now, in my community, um, we're really focused on overall flow throughput. Um, we do have some issues with contention, but our networks are currently undersubscribed right now, so we have a lot of headroom. But we're really interested in making sure that any of, the, any of the flows that are in progress are actually making optimal use of the network. This is not, as you all know, this is not as easy as it would seem. Um, so we wanna have real world data on a per flow basis um, to allow us to try and get a better look into how each flow is currently um, the performance of individual flows at that point, specifically between data transfer nodes. Uh, the other aspect to this is that we really wanna be able to use it so we can have a collected set of data. So when a user comes to us and says they're having a problem, we don't have to do that standard dance where you end up spending three weeks trying to get a trace route from a user who doesn't know what a trace route is. So if we have a set of data on their real world flows at that time, we can start the process of diagnosing and resolving their problems as soon as possible. So that's my use case. That's why I'm interested in this. Uh, we have other people who have use cases which are very uh, different. Um, been in communication with uh, some people from Twitter. Twitter is interested in terms of for example, what they're interested in, in is they have a bunch of containers each running their own stack. Occasionally what happens is they have jobs interfering with each other and they'd like to know why that's happening. So in terms of trying to determine that, they want a specific set of instruments, um, packet and byte statistics, congestion metrics, uh, RTT metrics, queue lengths, uh, things along those lines that'll tell them what's happening inside of their data center as their containers are talking to each other. Um, so at this point, if anyone has any use cases that they're interested in doing, and again, this is an open discussion, 
um, I really want people to start talking about what they're interested in, in trying to see with these instruments. Um, yeah, I just have one question. You were talking earlier about moving your terabytes of data around. I'm curious what the geographic distance is you're moving them across. Uh, at least transcontinental. Like, we're doing a lot from San Diego over to New York, New York down to Miami. Uh, we have, you know, we also have transnational, like transpacific and transatlantic transfers as well. So we're also dealing with shorter latency, smaller latencies as well. Uh, so we'll have ones that like a 10 millisecond latency, then we'll have ones that are 150 millisecond. So it's all over the place. Uh, we're also dealing with issues that are inside of campus networks as well. We're moving data from um, dedicated data transfer nodes to the compute resources, and we want to get an idea of what's happening in there as well. So does anyone have any use cases that they think instrumentation would be useful for where they're not getting enough information out of the stack? And most uh, uh, companies with their own data centers want to get mm -hmm. is like, you know, uh, bytes, bytes or packets per second, et cetera. But yes. uh, there's also the other use scenario where we may want to get very detailed information about particular flows, which could be either statistically or some specific flows to understand better the behavior of those flows to try to find uh, problems with TCP or with some other uh, environment. And I think the solutions for each of these may be different. Yes. Uh, but I think those are two important cases to consider. So one of the things that um, I think instrumentation can provide is if it's done correctly. So, all right, we're academics, so the thing that we did is we just implemented 127 different metrics and just threw everything against a wall. Um, I'm not suggesting that we do anything like that. Um, there are different use cases where subsets of instruments would be useful. So like in your case, you'd want some general statistics and then at the same time, you, you'd probably want more detailed data from a certain subset of these flows or for a specific server or something like that. Um, that's one of those implementation questions that need to be addressed once we figure out what instruments we're most interested in. Uh, it should be possible to be able to enable or disable subsets of instruments that are of most use to specific uh, use cases. Um, so we could have lightweight set of instruments that are providing general statistics, and then as the need arises, we might have a way of enabling an extended step, extended set of statistics that'll give us the detailed analysis that you're looking for. So, yeah, I agree. Ideally, it would be something that we can do dynamically. Yes. The specification. And also, the data containers need to be self-describing because we may want to say, well, for these connections, I want to get, you know, detail about RTT, congestion window, much less than the 127, you know, that you currently have. Yeah. So, okay. um, Matt, did you want to talk about the self-describing containers, self-describing data for a moment? I'm, I'm Matt Mathis, the first author in 4898. Um, uh, before I talk about self-describing uh, binary representations, I wanted to actually make two other comments. Um, so I was Chris's predecessor at PSC. Uh, all the titles didn't exactly match. And I came from an environment of, of, at that point, nearly two decades of TCP debugging experience. My first TCP trace was on a network that maximum speed coast to coast was only uh, let's see, I'll, I'll say five megabits, but that was the total, well, the total, never mind. Anyhow, um, 20 years of, of debugging applications, and the question that the, that the 4898 really tried to answer is, for all the debugging flowcharts I ever went through, what's the fastest way to get close to the problem? And that was the intent of the, pro of the of the sort of the design the other goal for the document was to have always on statistics that one could imagine aggregating in various ways to do things like um, 
fingerprinting of ISPs that were doing mischief. So if you collect data from lots of places, and you, c you can do, imagine doing sort of tomography of ISPs that are perhaps doing something you wanted to know about. Um, so those were the two sort of driving forces behind the original design of the document. I was told that it was much too big and complicated, and I ignored the advice. I now regret that. Um, there are some other mistakes in it as well. Um, one of the things that strikes me as being, and this is what Chris was referring to, that's a big problem in this space is one size fits all is not a good answer here. And if any service in the kernel needs to have a way of doing a self-describing compact binary format which can be tuned per customer, this is one of them. And I, I don't know I'm not really a kernel guy, I'm a networking guy. I don't know if this kind of service exists elsewhere in the kernel where you can do things. Um, I know Google recently published Protobus specification. Uh, we use it at scale for the many things of the sort and something like that would actually make a lot of sense. So I'm Dave Miller. I maintain, maintain a networking stack, so maybe I can answer some of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so first, I want to say something first, which is that uh, the impression that I, the, the, the most significant impression I get from this is that if you create an RFC with a couple hundred statistical re recommendations in it for us, that creates a large gap. And what traditionally what would happen for some facility like this is that evolutionary, in an evolutionary way over t many years, people would gradually recommend specific use cases where they're finding a specific counter being useful to them. So now we've created a situation where somebody has to invest the time to go through all of these and, and individually justify each of them and go through this whole conversation. The original context of where you, what led you to add that that counter in the first place might even be lost upon the person who has to justify it for us. So I think that's that's the disconnect that's happening with this facility right now and uh, why it's, it, it would be perhaps taking more effort than it otherwise would have to integrate the functionality that you're looking for. I, I actually agree with that very much. Um, we made a mistake and uh, fully admit to that. Um, the mistake we made was that, honestly, we just implemented everything in that RFC and then threw it at the dev team without providing any sort of justification or providing the use cases or the validation that they need to actually make it functional and actually really consider it. The goal here at this point is not to turn around and justify RFC 4898. Not interested in doing that. Uh, what I am interested in doing is trying to find where peop what people think about stack instrumentation and if there is interest, what's the subset of instruments that enough people agree on to make it worthwhile to really invest the time in. And moving from that subset we can start exploring different instruments in a more piecemeal and evolutionary sort of basis um, so I mean I fully agree with you I really do and we really made a mistake when we we submitted that patch um, so that's the goal here is to actually try and figure out where peop where we have enough overlap to make the time investment worthwhile um, and I guess one of the questions I have is, do people think that there should be some higher level of instrumentation in the stack? Can I yes. answer to this question? I'm Eric Dinoze. Hi. I'm just over there. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah. So, we do have some needs at Google for adding specific stuff. Uh, what one thing to understand is that right I'm sorry, now... sorry, could you speak up a little? One thing to understand right now is that the TCP socket is big. 
in the mm -hmm. kernel. It's about two kilobytes of memory. Uh, typically, it means that uh, an incoming packet can bring in the CPU cache a lot of cache lines. Yes. Um, it's something like one or two microseconds per packet. So it's interesting to see that the networking speed is increasing very fast. We used to have 10 gig, we now have 40 gig, 100 gig, gig very shortly, but the processing speed is the same. The memory bandwidth is the same. So a counter is eight bytes. Mm -hmm. Eight counters are 64 bytes, a cache line. A cache line is 100 nanosecond hit. Uh, so we really need to don't bloat the TCP socket. That's real, real, that's the real thing. So I, I agree with that. So at Google, we prefer uh, just extending the TCP info, mm -hmm. which already contains a lot of um, metrics. And we plan to stand up stream patch for that, but we do not want to add more than eight new metrics. So that's the goal. And, and if someone wants something else, some specific use, you always can add probes or whatever you need into your local tree for your specific needs. Uh, or you can use external tools like TCP dump. And you can infer a lot of metrics just by analyzing raw data. And you can get much more entropy, much more useful input from raw data than statistical controls anyway. I have to say I disagree about TCP dump. Um, and that's, I mean, having a disagreement is fine with this. Um, one of the issues we found with TCP dump is if we're gonna be monitoring a large number of connections, TCP dump just isn't an effective tool for that. Um, in our use case, we wanna have instrumentation on all of the flows that we have going in and out of our data transfers, our data transfer centers. Uh, having a TCP dump running on those when we're moving, you know, so we have I might gigs just in. explain what we are doing. We use the global SNMP counters to try to track for anomalies. Mm -hmm. And if we have some anomalies, we do use TCP dump on selected flows. For example, at Google, we have this user-facing servers serving YouTube, stuff like that. And we have this um, random capture of about 1% one hun one percent of the flows. So even if we have some problems, we can have some historical data yeah. with raw data. And we don't need to capture all the data because it would be insane. Yes. Uh, you, are, you are speaking of terabytes. Terabits, you can multiply by 1,000 for Google. It's just insane. Yeah. So, okay, and so the other th thing is what brings uh, these uh, metrics? Uh, they are useful to track some anomalies in the stack, fix bugs, things like that. So, and really, really, in this case, TCP dump helps a lot because you are capturing the packet and you can spot some anomalies, like something like a statistical counter cannot track. There is no way you can track some anomaly in SAC processing or whatever. Uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to track real bugs in the stack with just counters. I understand where you're coming from and uh, if I really do, I actually really appreciate what you're saying. I really do. And I think this sort of back and forth is important to figuring out where we want to go. Um, I don't think that methodology works as, as well in our situation as it may in yours. Um, and for very obvious reasons, we have different business cases, we have different use cases, we have different ways of actually setting up our networks. 
Um, and I think that's really what we're trying to get here is where do we have at least some level of overlap that we can work together on and move forward from there? And I agree with you about not wanting to bloat the, bloat the socket any more than it already is. Um, we don't want to add, make it even slower. We don't want to have our instruments make things slower if they're not providing any value. In fact, we don't want to have it make, any, make it slower at all. Um, <coughs> so I guess what I'm, I'm really trying to get at, get at is one of the things I really want to try doing is find where we have some overlap and see if there's some place where we can actually find some common ground so we can work together on this as opposed to opposing each other. Um, yeah. Oh, and one thing. I, I'm not opposed, even though I have a different methodology for bringing the stack bring the instruments out of the stack, I'm not wedded to that. I have no ego invested in my specific code. I'm willing to do whatever's necessary to get the instruments out. I care about the instruments rather than my specific implementation. I'm sorry to interrupt, go on. Um, my name is Thomas Scott. Maybe I can give you another uh, use case. Our, our use case probably overlaps with the, with the Twitter use case. We're, we're, uh, in we're doing policy multi-tenant data centers and we use metrics for two different purposes. One is troubleshooting, providing troubleshooting tools if you have a problem. And I agree with Eric that a static set of counters doesn't work for us. We figured out that if we add counters, it's usually not the ones that you need at that time. Uh, so you're just slowing down the networking stack without providing any additional value. That's just my, my existing experience so far. So what mm -hmm. we figured is that if you want to capture additional metrics for troubleshooting, you need to make it um, programmable, so you can, if you want to troubleshoot a specific problem, you can insert certain rules, some program, eBPF, whatever, to capture additional metrics. Obviously, that only works if you if you know ahead of time that you're going to want to capture something. Yeah. You cannot look back, right? This is, the, this is the disadvantage. The second use case is if you have a policy and you have to monitor your network and you, you need some kind of feedback from the network that, that so you can, you, can, you can modify how you, how you configure or program your, your network. Uh, and in this case, uh, a, a, set, a set of static counters works a little bit better because usually you're interested in common statistics like byte counters, uh, RTT, queue length, whatever. So what, we, what I've learned so far is that for static counters works fairly well for well-known defined use cases like monitoring queue length, but it does not really work for any kind of troubleshooting um, of complex networking issues. Okay. And I, I think that a programmable approach would be um, superior. So how would you, how do you envision that? Have you seen um, Alexei's EPPF presentation yes. yesterday? I think that is pretty close to what I would have in mind as well. To, um, I agree that a, a common self-describing self data format would be extremely um, beneficial. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the, the interfacing of the kernel could be based on EPPF, where you where you only uh, insert the overhead of capturing additional metrics when you actually need it. Yes. If you if you want to capture it all the time, fine. You can you can boot your kernel and just insert EPPF rule right away. But you're not requiring everybody um, to run these metrics all the time, and you're not inserting uh, fast path checks to actually disable or enable counters and stuff like that. Yeah. One of the things we did with Web10G uh, is we actually have instruments are enabled via a mask. So you only have the instruments on that you care about. So we're not capturing, we don't necessarily capture all the data all the time. We just capture the subset that people are most interested in. Um, now again, these are static counters. Some of them are, um, some of them are just, you know, byte counters. How many bytes have we seen? How many sacks have we seen? Others are how many congestion events we've seen. And then we have some uh, instruments that are actually um, computed, things like uh, pipe size, things like that. So I agree with you that having all the metrics on all the time is not the way to do this. Uh, and having some sort of programmable interface where we can enable certain instruments on the fly or based on certain conditions is probably the way to move forward on something like this. 
Um, Matt, are you looking for something? Might as well move forward a tiny bit. Eric, I have a question about um, cash efficiency and so on. Really beyond my area. Um, how much would it m does it matter if you have instruments that are not hit particularly often, as opposed to off instruments that are hit in every packet? I guess it, the answer depends how you organize the field in the socket, and. Currently in the kernel, we have this layout of having um, the least, you know, we have this uh, class of objects with a common socket layer, very small socket, and then the INET socket, and then the TCP socket. And actually, it's pretty hard to organize the fields in an efficient way. For example, the receive path and the output path, because we still have to hit different fields from this three different sockets. So it's very hard to cache optimize the thing. So we could do that uh, doing some very smart uh, placement of these fields, but the current architecture of the kernel doesn't really allow that. Uh, that's a bit hard. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe David has some idea about that, but uh, So since we kind of brought it up with what Thomas was talking about earlier, uh, actually I'm going to direct the question at Thomas. So if you, you were envisioning an, an eBBF type solution where people would insert uh, EBF rules that are triggered by events or function calls or whatever to collect statistics, uh, I'm kind of wondering if you thought about where you would be storing that metadata that EBF would be operating on and collecting the statistics? Uh, would it be like an indirect pointer from the TCP bucket or something like 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 that or because we're not going to want to eat up the storage all the time obviously mm -hmm. so I'm wondering what kind of ideas you had in that area so so maybe it would be over tracing with the legs I showed yesterday that you insert those uh, trace points dynamically and store that uh, counters and eBPF maps so you wouldn't actually I mean, if if that approach would work, we didn't would need to store uh, anything in a socket, for example. Because I I kind of imagine that a lot of people who would use these tools would want to be able to fetch the information for a particular flow, as if in the and the traditional way to do that is to dump socket state. So you would have to have some mapping back to the tracing information from socket ID or something like this. Um. I haven't really thought it through yet. Uh, I would have imagined that we can we can use a a map that is where we where we map this metadata and it's well known. Um, basically, just uh, inject the eBPF program to actually start capturing. But the definition of the counters could be could could already exist. But and and uh, um, the the map to the socket would be a well defined one that that already so exists. So my question, so basically what you're saying is that the metadata is an external entity that is not going to be in the socket in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, I'm th maybe you have a map and you can, uh, you, can you can access that map if the socket pointer, for example, to store s per socket metrics. Okay, or so maybe you want to you store metrics not just per, per, per socket, but per your own flow definition. Do you want to store it based on another classifier? So you could define your own classifier which says, I want to store these counters based on a hash of the packet or something like that. So I kind of like this idea even more because it kind of obviates the whole discussion of how efficient are these counters going to be inside the socket because we're storing them somewhere else. And therefore, when the counters, the counter collection is not enabled, the storage overhead doesn't exist, as well as the uh, inefficient layouts or caching issues within the socket itself are kind of like just not even an issue. Yeah, I mean, one, one typical example would be that some people might just want to keep metrics per namespace and not even per, per socket because they know whatever socket is in a given namespace actually shares the same metric. They don't care between the, the different sockets. And you could use that to isolate the case that you're trying to analyze. You could say, when I have this, this researcher is running this problem to this site, 
we're going to put him in a namespace and enable the tracing for that namespace. And that eliminates all the difficulty of filtering your tracing on a per connection basis. You can control it on a namespace basis. Cool. Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are storing the we are storing the counters outside of the socket, correct? In Web 10G? Okay. Yeah, so we've actually implemented, uh, the way that we implement the storage for this, probably not the most efficient way, but we're not storing it inside of the socket. We're storing it out, we're storing, storing the data outside of the socket, and uh, So what, what's the mechanism you get to that blob? Uh, that's a good question. Do you have a hash table of? Okay, so there's a pointer that references yeah. to it. Okay, so yes. that's how that's like kind of like the midway between the completely external solution and the one where you actually put the counters inside the. There socket. is uh, one thing I don't really like about WebTNG. The truth is, we try to use WebTNG at Google and we reverted the patch. Um, so there is this uh, thing about WebTNG. Uh, it wants to dump the state uh, at the end of the circuit. So when you close the circuit, you have this asynchronous uh, event. It uses a war queue, and it wants to dump data to a remote collector. And it's kind of um, it's the same thing as Netlink. So really, this kind of stuff should be handled by Netlink, um, because we already have this monitoring uh, stuff in Netlink. You can have any subscriber to the multicast event. It's, yeah, so right now there, there is this work queue and one of the issues we had at Google was that the work queue management was not really working properly and we yeah. had crash because of that. So that's partially why we reverted the, the patch. Yeah, and we understood that was, ha we, we were told that was happening. Um, the only thing I would have asked is that no one at Google told us that was happening until it was too late. Um, we've resolved a lot of those problems in the later versions of the code. Um, the work queue management is, po is possibly not the most efficient way of doing this. Um, we do have Netlink interfaces to the data uh, so that we can bring it out of the kernel. If we can integrate that more tightly into the existing Netlink structures for monitoring, that's probably going to be a better move moving forward. Um, the Goal is, is uh, you know, I've had too much coffee and I just lost my train of thought. So, anyway, so this moves us on to, I mean, like we've already been talking about some of the implementation aspects of this. Um, I really do think that, and I really hope as many of you actually join the mailing list as possible because I think that's where we're really going to start talking about what set of instruments. Um, are going to be most useful, and I really want Google involved in this. So, uh, if I can continue, uh, we. Oh yes, yeah, so certainly. I'm sorry. So we we did revert this thing, and we are planning to extend TCP info, so that we can get the Netlink notification uh, for free. So, at the end of the circuit, we will uh, provide this, uh, a copy of the TCP info mm -hmm. uh, through Netlink uh, multicast interface. So, it will basically provide what. Web10G users wanted at Google without the full Web10G uh, footprint. Okay. I kind of suspect that as we go along doing this, you're going to have two classes of information that you're going to look at. You're going to have a bunch of things that you're going to be able to narrow down to your eight magic counters or whatever that number ends up being that we kind of all agree that is useful to be in there all the time and always being collected and always being fetchable and always being available for users. And then we're going to have this stuff that, that's going to be like we only want to, this is extra, this is applied to uh, a narrower scope of use cases and therefore wants to be turned on and the overhead for which being uh, happening only when explicitly asked for. So. Yeah. So Hello? Um, so that's actually true, and I would view it more like there's <coughs> things that are more operational, and the operational stuff we want on all the time, and then for debugging the deep problems, uh, what's happening. So I would point out one interesting thing about Google is um, all of this is in a larger context, which is network operations. And one of the things that obviously a lot of people do is they're running S-Flow on routers and switches, 
And what we need to do is often is correlate information in the kernel with information in S-Flow. S-Flow by definition is kind of a statistical uh, sampling, so we don't have perfect information there. <coughs> Theoretically, the kernel does have perfect information, which is a big difference. The one thing that we don't get out of S-Flow that we really kind of want um, is anything to do with state or, or retransmits and things like that. And that's where um, you know, there are obviously people who just want to do everything in S-Flow because it's a standard. You have to deal with fewer entities, actually, so a lot fewer switches and hosts. Um, but what we found out is there are just certain things you cannot get out of S-Flow by sampling. And the big one was retransmits, and that was very important to figure out uh, what's happening. So um, I think what Dave said is, that, um, is very true, and it does come down to these two sets of information, the things that are up of operational that always have to be there. It's maybe more than just bytes and packet counts. And then, obviously, the ability when you're doing debugging or, or deeper analysis or possibly random sampling to turn on the more advanced statistics. So um, I think if you start from that point of view, then look at how the APIs uh, project from that. So when you see TPO info and that link, because there's going to be different, even with a single use case, there's different users, yeah. different people who are different interested in different aspects of the same connection. I agree. Uh, and uh, like I said, one of the things that we tried to do in uh, Web10G, we're actually calling it eStats at this point, but Web10G, is enabling different sets of instruments on the fly. So you can actually change what instruments uh, you're going to be collecting at any point. You can turn them all off, you can turn them all on, you can turn on. Uh, we have them separated into five different tables. Uh, so you can turn on an entire table or you can turn on a subset of instruments within a specific table or across tables. Um, we found that to be probably the best way of doing things just because no one wants all the information all the time. And some of these instruments are only going to be useful in a very small subset of cases. Um, I like the idea of having different namespaces having different instruments enabled. I don't know how difficult that would be to implement. Um, right now, this is a system-wide setting. So it's, you know, all the instruments are on in the entire kernel for all users um, or the subset for all users. It would be interesting to have one user or one set of, one set of um, group having a different set of instruments enabled than another, depending on the namespace or something like that. Um, and I really think that's, that could be really cool. Um, so the implementation aspects of this, I do think there's some overlap between what we've already done with Web10G and where we want to go. Uh, and again, I'm not, I have no ego invested in the code. Uh, all I really care about is trying to provide better, um, I really care about my users, I want to provide a better experience to my users. So whatever method we need to get there, I'm behind. Uh, if we can capture some of the concepts or code that we've already developed for Web10G and integrate it with other aspects and other ideas, I think that might be helpful. Um, but however we want to move forward on this, you know, I'm invested in this. I've spent many years of my life already working on this. I'd like to see it go forward. And I think this would be something that'd be useful for uh, the Linux community as a whole. So um, I think we've already made some progress on that. I think yeah. we all kind of agree that the, ab ab about the operational versus non-operational -op issue yeah. and that TCP info would be the logical place to put the operational yeah. values. So what does that leave us with? What that leaves us with uh, designing the non-operational aspect of this problem, which is the aspect that you're the most interested in right now, I think. Yes. Um, so I think once, once we have a game plan for where it goes and how it gets collected, then you can start talking about adding things, the individual elements, and uh, one by one going through the justification process or whatever you want to do about it. So I think considering either what Thomas suggested with EBP, eBPF probes that get dynamically out of, out, uh, enabled or just dis disabled or some other conditionalization like static 
probes, which is another facility that we have inside the kernel for doing things in a fast manner to test at runtime whether we should do something or not. Uh, we should work that out. That's what needs to get worked out yeah. first. And uh, so, so work out the implementation. Work out the work. implementation of the non-operational aspects of the counters that everyone is interested in. Okay. Okay. Sounds good to me. Uh, and Five minutes left. Yeah, I was going to wrap things up at this point. Um, again, uh, if you want to be on the mailing list, I'm going to be setting up the mailing list hopefully tomorrow. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Now you talk about the mailing list. Uh, whatever you discuss, can you periodically kind of say, here's where we are on that dev? Yes. Because yes. I'm overloaded already, so I, I'm not going to join your mailing list. But no, I'm I understand. I am interested in what you're working on, so I would like to know where things are standing once in a while. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem at all. So we'll get a mailing list together, see about forming some sort of working group on this, maybe some future meetups, and the big thing is I w do want to coordinate our effort. I don't want to have. I think having disagreements and different ideas of how to implement things makes sense and it really helps push things forward, but I'd really rather not having us working against each other as we move forward on this. Um, so, and while I am setting this up, I'm not saying that I'm in a leadership role on this, I'd be happy to take that, but whoever wants to start doing more work on this, just please stand up and let me know. Um, I am very happy you're all here, and thank you so much for your time and attention on this. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you.